called Let's Talk Business. Um, this is a monthly series we put on, and we are lucky to have um, special guests that talk about issues in business that are affecting um, all of us today. So, um, <clears throat> first and foremost, we just wanted to do a little um, some tips about running the webinar. Um, if you just bear with us real quickly here. Okay, so here are some tips. So I have all of you muted right now. Um, if you do want to speak up, um, go ahead and kick and uh, push the raise hand button uh, to ask questions. Um, and that will let us know that you, you want to ask a question, then I can unmute you. Um, if you're having trouble hearing us, is it, if anyone's having trouble hearing us, you can use your phone to call in. Um, and that's going to allow you to have a better audio situation. Um, feel free to use the chat box to ask questions at any time. Um, and the presenter will be happy to answer those questions for you, um, or I can convey them to the presenter. I um, just wanted to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. We are the Washington Center for Women in Business. Uh, we, pr we provide small business services um, for organizations or people with ideas for organizations in Washington State. Uh, we have two main programs. Our first program is our BEST program, which is our business enterprise startup training. Um, this is an eight-week webinar course, similar to what we're going to be seeing today. Um, and the idea is that you come into this program with an idea for a business, and you leave with a business plan, um, and you're ready to go seek funding. Um, we do have scholarships available for rural clients. The program's cost is usually $395, and it does include um, access to the business application live plan, which helps you write a business plan. So again, if you know anyone that has an idea for a business, I mean, this just isn't women, we also uh, work with men too, um, and you think that this is a good, a good program for them, let them know, um, and the next one starts on the 14th of January. Um, we also do small business one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, and this is for people that are further along in their businesses and need help with business plans, marketing, um, uh, visual merchandising, taxes, accounting, any of that kind of good stuff, we can help you out. Um, it's the, the business coaching sessions are one hour. They're $25 per session. Um, the first coaching session is free, um, and those can be done over the phone or through, uh, through a one-on-one -on -one, um, in-person training at our uh, location in the Thurston Economic Development Council in Lacey. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the presenter here. I just got to pull up their slideshow. Okay, and Ryan, are you ready to go ahead? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Go ahead and put it into slide mode. It doesn't look like it's in slide mode yet. Okay, we'll just swap the presenter here. Okay, how's that look? That looks good right there. Okay, so just tell me when you want me to switch the slides, yeah? All right, very good. Um, folks, welcome out. Uh, go ahead and uh, flip to the next slide, and let me just explain. Um, I don't know, I can't see the names and how many people are out there, but, uh, and I'm a real kind of a personal, personable type of person. I like to look people in the eyeballs and, and, or at least have kind of a sense of who's out there. So, uh, in as much as we don't have that, I'm just going to assume that you're a bunch of wonderful, incredible people all excited about the holidays and you have all of your shopping done. Everything's done. Uh, you're just sitting around drumming your fingers on the desk going, dang, this is, this is easy, right? <laughs> not if you're normal so I hope everything goes well for you in the last few days of work and holidays and preparation uh, you guys have a great a great experience this holiday season I wish that for all of you uh, SOFA is the Society for, for, for Financial Awareness and this organization has been around since 1993 the sole mission of SOFA is to be able to provide resources and guidance for individuals and businesses um, around the country so that they can improve their financial literacy. It is literally an educational outreach. Um, there's no selling. It's a 501c3. 
Um, this is really just a solid effort to put educational information in front of uh, the general public as well as small business. So this is a perfect venue for us, taking advantage of technology. Nobody has to travel. You can stay in the comfort of wherever you're at in your office, and we can just spend some time together. Um, there is the capability through this technology for you to ask questions. Um, I think there's a button you can click to raise your hand, uh, and then uh, you can, uh, these guys, uh, Ryan and, um, uh, is it Sean? Yeah, Ryan and Sean will be able to uh, activate so you can ask a question. I don't mind it. I, I really don't consider an interruption. If you've got a question, it's a whole lot better to uh, address it right now. Uh, because you'll probably forget if we keep going or you'll keep thinking about it and you'll miss the next thing that's going on. The only time it's really the formality is convenient is for the speaker, for the presenter. Uh, and if it bothers them, uh, sometimes they'll say, ah, hold all the questions till the end. That's for their convenience. I'm telling you right now, I don't care. So if you want to interrupt, if you got a question, as long as it isn't about marriage counseling, uh, we'll take it. All right. So go ahead and move to the next one. Um, SOFA is, um, like I say, it's, it's a worldwide or a nationwide, um, there you go, organization. This is, there's hundreds of companies that we've worked with as well as um, smaller groups, uh, but this is just some of the names you might recognize. So we're not a, a bit player. Uh, we're established in the market and recognized as a powerful source of financial information to, uh, to businesses. And um, it's something that we're glad to be able to present to you. All right, so next one. Let's start, uh, we're, we're talking about today, the subject is talking about preparing for the end of the year for small business in terms of taxes. Things that you can do to change and improve or reduce uh, your tax burden as you move in towards the end of the year. So we'll talk with some basic information and then we'll go into some specific suggestions. And if that uh, generates some questions, I will do my best to answer them for you. However, because we're talking about taxes, I'm not a CPA. Um, uh, I am a financial planner and I'm well versed in all things having to do with finances and retirement and, and some aspects of taxes. And I know quite a bit, but there will be some things uh, if you ask a certain question, I'm gonna say, you know what, I'm not licensed to answer that question as a absolute, you know, you need to talk to your CPA. So with that, as a qualification, um, let's go. In fact, could we just test something? Could somebody try? You don't have to necessarily uh, answer a full or ask a full on question, but let's just make sure that, that we know how to operate this. I don't want to, to go into this and find out that people were trying to ask questions and couldn't. So could somebody just volunteer to say at least hi or something and test out the system? Somebody click on the raised hand uh, and I think Sean or Ryan will click on a microphone. I don't know exactly how you do that, but uh, let's just test it real quick. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, unmute Nettie. Okay. So Nettie, you're unmuted, say something. So I just well, everyone's mics on. I, I can hear you. Hello. Can I you think hear me? Okay. Sounds like you turned them all on. So if you raise your hand, I think they will they will see something and they'll, they'll turn the mics on and you can ask ask your question. Yeah, so I can see the raised hand, so I'll let you know. All right, perfect. Okay, so there are no questions as of yet, so you can continue. There we go. I had, it, it muted me when you did that, and I was sitting here talking yeah. to you guys, wondering why you weren't responding. Uh, the, the slide seems to be reduced on my end. Can you pop it back up? Or if it's full on your end, then that's fine. We'll just keep going. Yeah, it's full on my end. Okay, good. Then then I'll just keep going here. Uh, so let's talk about this. We're, we're going to talk about a number of things that can help you prepare for taxes, as well as some specific suggestions that may save you some money or things you might haven't thought of as we get close to the end of the year. There's still time to do quite a number of things, by the way. So let's talk about the marginal tax rates. Um, folks, first of all, 
I talk to people all the time who tell me that, oh, I pay 25 or 24 percent in taxes or I pay 22 percent in taxes or I pay 32 percent in taxes if they're a little bit higher income. Guys, nobody pays 32 percent or 24 percent in taxes as a tax bracket, as their as their rate. It's marginal. When you look at the rates there, the first nine thousand seven hundred dollars of taxable income in 2019 is going to be taxed at 10 percent. The next from 9,700 up to 39,475 is going to be taxed at 12 percent. So the, the important number that you should know, every one of you should know in terms of taxes is what your effective tax rate is. The effective tax rate is what is the actual percentage of your adjusted gross income that actually went out in taxes. And that's going to be an average or it's going to be not so much an average, but it'll be mitigated by combining some 10% tax, some 12% tax, some 22 and some 24. About 90 plus percent of everybody that I work with, no matter how much money they have, have a effective tax rate of less than 15%. Some of them single digits. And they're the same people say, oh no, I pay 22% in tax. No, actually you don't, you pay 11. What? No, it says 22%. Yeah, exactly. On the last dollars that were taxed, but not on the first nine and not on between nine and, and 40,000, essentially, right? So you need to understand effective tax rate is a significant number. You, 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 that's the one that counts. It's really the only one that counts. You know, why, what was the total percentage of my income that went out? And you need to know that. And it is not your bracket. Uh, the previous year, you can see on the right, 2019. Basically, you should also know that 2020, it goes up, goes up by about $185 for the single and about $350 for the married filing jointly. And each one of the, the different combinations or uh, different con uh, configurations went up. All of them went up a little bit for 2020. But for 2019, for your filing uh, before April or for the end of the year, this is the numbers that are going to affect you uh, and, it, and it's the single, this is the married filing jointly, you are going to have the businesses. All of those were adjusted up from the previous number. All of them are adjusted up slightly for 2020. So you just need to know. Next one, please. All right. So the standard deduction increases to simplify filings. Guys, this is pretty, uh, pretty shocking. When you look at the number of people that are filing using just now the new standard deduction, uh, it's it's pretty interesting. It's gone from about just over 50% to, they say that this year, 90% of all tax filers are going to use the standard deductions as opposed to itemizing. Because of the changes in the deductions, the itemization, it, it, becomes, it becomes quite difficult to itemize and come up with more than what the standard deduction is. So for a single, uh, it's $12,000, which means $12,000 of your taxable income gets uh, deducted. You, you get a credit for that or against that to where you don't pay taxes on 12,000 of your adjusted gross income, okay? So, and, well, technically that sounds a little bit odd the way I said it perhaps. Part of adjusting, your adjusted gross income is your taxable income. And that will include taking 12,000 after you've taken, uh, you've listed everything that you are going to be taxed on. You've calculated that out. Then you take 12,000 off of the top. So your income goes, your taxable income goes down by 12,000 for single. Uh, sorry about that. It goes down for um, uh, married filing jointly. It's 24,000. And, uh, 24.4 rather, 12,002 for the single, and it goes up for 2020. So it'll be higher for 2020. And it is, it's really uh, becoming pretty ubiquitous. Like I say, 90% of filers this year are expected to use this instead of, um, and I need to put on my do not disturb, I apologize. Where is that button here? There we go, do not disturb. All right. so about 90% are going to use this because it's tough to make the deductions, individual deductions, uh, any higher. Um, one thing that is a, kind of an interesting distinction is just to make sure you have clear in your mind the difference between a deduction 
uh, and, and exemptions. Okay. And then when we talk about tax credits, uh, we're going to talk about that as well, because sometimes people get confused between what the idea of a tax credit uh, is as opposed to a tax deduction. The short version of a long explanation is that when you have an option to choose between a tax credit and a tax deduction, you're basically always going to want to choose a tax credit. And here's why. A tax credit is a, uh, a, a straight reduction dollar for dollar. So if, so if you do your calculations and it shows that you owe $10,000 in taxes and you've got a $3,000 tax credit, you take 3000 off of that 10. That's it's just a great a direct dollar for dollar deduction of tax liability, which is pretty powerful. A deduction, on the other hand, is going to be, uh, let's say, if you have a thousand dollar deduction uh, on a 25 percent tax bracket, it's going to save you two hundred and fifty dollars. So your thousand dollar deduction really translates into two hundred and fifty dollars. Whereas a tax credit is a dollar for dollar tax reduction. Okay. So when you have the option or when you're talking about tax credits versus deductions, there is a difference. And where possible, uh, you're going to almost always see a benefit to taking the tax credit over a deduction. So just keep that definition in mind. Okay. Next one, please. Or just hit it again. Okay. So let's talk about some of the changes uh, also that have an impact from a tax standpoint, and that has to do with contributions. Um, the 401k and the Roth contributions are different for 2019. Uh, they raise the limits on how much you can contribute to 401ks. It's now $25,000. Uh, the Roth, convert, the Roth uh, contributions and traditional IRA limits, however, remained at seven. They didn't change those. And that's for people over 50, 6,500 if you're below, um, but it raised it up. If you're um, above 50, it raised that up to 7,000. Okay, so those are your contribution limits. Just hit your enter key, please. Go ahead and, and advance, there you go. So, When, when we talk about uh, legacy planning, the good news is that estate planning limits uh, went up dramatically with the, uh, the changes to the tax code last year. Uh, hit the enter button one time, please. The estate exemption doubled from 11.4 million uh, for individuals up to 22.8, it went, it doubled up to 11.4 for an individual and 22.8 for a couple. Uh, that was huge. It, it basically it doubled. Uh, enter again, please. The gift exclusions, however, stayed at 15,000. I want to explain this real quick because a lot of people don't understand this. And this is where uh, this is going to have a big impact to you folks. It really can if you utilize this. If there's any gift giving in your, in your future, in your blood, in your inclination, um, you can give a tax-free gift of $15,000 per year to as many individual uh, people as you want to. Uh, if you wanted to do gifting, you can do a tax-free gift to an individual or multiple individuals. Uh, if you are in your personal life, if there's two of you, each one of you can do that. So a couple could give $30,000 per person to as many different people as they want. There's also an educational criteria that if you apply that just to education only, okay, so if it's for education purposes, you can give up to five years at a time. So if you took 15 times two, that's 30,000 times five years, that's a big chunk of change that you could give to a single individual if you're trying to help them in something related to uh, education. So just be aware of those uh, limit, the gifting limits. A lot of people aren't. Uh, enter, please. And then they also, you've got in this state, Washington state, the tax um, for a state tax limit is up to $2.2 million per household. So that's a limit. Sometimes people will look at that and say, oh, well, I don't have $2.2 million. I don't count. Well, it's, this is an estate, right? So it includes your real estate. It includes um, as well as the assets you would have in bank accounts and brokerage accounts and things like that. It, this is an estate tax. 
So some people who think that they're flying under the radar really aren't. And you might think you're okay now, but in three or four or five years with appreciation in real estate and growth in your accounts, uh, you may come under that. I, I will tell you this, that anecdotally in the finance community, there's a phraseology that goes something like this. Nobody pays estate taxes in the state of Washington unless they want to or they're ignorant. And that's a little tongue in cheek and it's simply because it is not very difficult to do planning in the state of Washington to keep estates underneath that threshold. And if people don't know how to do it, then they're ignorant of what they could do, right? And if they decide they want to, well, that's fine. It's a, they do that, but they shouldn't do it ignorantly. And they should know that they have options if those options are available. And they are. Next. Okay, so let's talk, talk about the changes in the itemized deduction. And I, I, I just want to go through this quickly because there will be some of you who think, and you may be right. I'm not saying that you're wrong. Uh, but if when 90% of folks are opting to just take the standard deduction, that means most people will have a, have a hard time coming up with enough, enough deductions to make it worth the while to go through that process. So let's go through the changes to the itemized deductions because these are the things that are causing 90% of people to use the standard deduction. Okay, so we'll talk about, uh, hit enter please. Let's talk about mortgage uh, deductions first. The mortgage interest, if you can hit the enter button, there you go. The mortgage interest is capped at 750,000. So if you have uh, a mortgage, if you have interest on a mortgage and that mortgage is over 750,000, you're out of luck. Uh, if you're gonna take a mortgage, try to do a deduction. Uh, it's capped there at 750,000. Um, hit the enter button, please. Charitable contributions. These have been increased significantly, uh, at least it looks significant, but it went from 50% to 60, which really isn't that big of a change. But the, the reason that it's kind of interesting is there's very, very few people, in fact, almost nobody, that contributes 50% of their AGI, their adjusted gross income, to charities, okay? So your charitable contributions can be listed in a itemized deduction format if you're going to do that, uh, but it's limited to 60% of your AGI up from 50%. Now, to be truthful, uh, or to be not truthful, that's a bad way to say it, right? But in full disclosure, there are some people that will use this, but it's usually when they're doing charitable remainder trusts or things that have to do with other strategies where they're trying to uh, reposition large amounts of money. But the average person making contributions does not use up the 50%, but it's there. That's, that's what the limit is. Go ahead and click again, please. Okay. The next one is medical expenses. And this is one that's frustrated a lot of people because of the way that this is capped, but it is. So it's reduced now to 7.5%, 7.5% for all ages. And it's retroactive, which is, that's a kick in the head, back to 2017. Um, after 2018, it is moved up to 10% for those that are 65 or less. So if you're under 65, that can slide up to 10%. Uh, but the bottom line is it's pretty low. You know, 10% of your AGI is the limit on uh, medical expenses. And some people have, you know, they've got some significant medical expenses and they wish that they could deduct them because in the past there was, it was more lenient that way. Next. And the last one on this uh, discussion here would be the state and local taxes. It's referred to as SALT. Uh, so state and local tax deduction is capped at $10,000. Um, so if you add up all of your state and local taxes, um, your limit would be $10,000. Now, when you look at the, uh, $12,000 limit now for individual and the 24,000, which is going to 25,000 now, 12,005 and 25,000 um, for the couple. Uh, it does make it difficult to come up with enough deductions to outdo that. And it's a little laborious because they've changed the rules on a lot of these things. So it's, it's doable, but you need to know uh, what the components are. There's one last little piece hit the, uh, Hit the button here one more time, please. 
And that has to do with um, moving expenses. Okay. And we can, can you go back one slide? I think you hit it too far. We went, we jumped over one thing. I was just, there you go. Right. Uh, oh, I, I see. Never mind. Never mind. That, that's right. This is right. You had it right. There we go. I have a quick question. Yes, please. Um, back on the last side, when you were talking about deductions for medical expenses, is that 7.5 to 10% of the adjusted gross income or of your total medical expenses? Yeah, my, my um, understanding on that is the adjusted gross income is after you take all of your deductions. Okay. So if I stated that wrong, um, I, I apologize. The, the AGI is adjusted gross income. So if you're going to itemize, you would take all of the deductions in order to come up with your AGI, and then that's what's going to be taxed. Right. No, my, my question is concerning the dollar amount of the medical expenses. Let's say I have $10,000 in medical expenses. Is that 7% of the 10000 of my medical expenses, or I can just put it in deducted of my before my low to lower my the, the total amount lower my agi by 10 7 to 10 percent does that make sense um yeah, yeah let me I'm let me Go ahead. yeah that's a great question let me see if i can answer it for you clearly because i understand what you're saying now um the medical costs are deductible only after they exceed 10 percent of your adjusted gross income so your medical uh, costs have got to exceed your AGI. So after you take all of the deductions that you can take, if the medical costs are greater than 10% of that, then you can start, um, then you can use them. So if your AGI, for example, if you had a $50,000 taxable income, the first mm -hmm. $5,000, which is 10% of unreimbursed medical costs doesn't count. So it would have to be the over the 10% ah. 5,000. Does that make sense? Total sense now. Thank you for the okay. example at the yeah. end. Very yeah. good. Yeah, no problem. If if I if it was confusing on my part, thank you for clarifying it because you're probably not the only one who had that question. <laughs> well, I appreciate your answer. I totally understand now. Okay, great. So uh, here we go. Let's talk about tax preparation. Um, you you can there there's something that's uh, there's a long list of deductions that did not survive the tax reform and investment management expenses can still be uh, a tax, they can still be used as a, they're an advantage or a tax advantage, but they're drawn directly if they're, but only if they're drawn directly from an IRA. So let me see if I can say that again. Investment management expenses can still be a tax advantage to you, but only when they're drawn directly from an IRA, okay? They, uh, but they can only be deducted in a proration. They have to be prorated to the other accounts. So you can't take it out of just one account. They have to be uh, taken out evenly with IRA expenses. And so, again, it's one of the things that changed. And the only place that it is applicable now is to uh, IRAs, and it has to be done on a prorated basis. Okay. Next one. Let's talk about, uh, there we go. And well, that's actually what I was looking at right there. So hit it one more time. All right, so other miscellaneous deductions previously that were subjected or subject to the 2% of the AGI. Um, with this one, let's see if I can get on the same one here. There we go. Uh, let's see. Put go ahead and click that one more time. So I want to. Okay. So these are all of the items here. Um, these are the ones that are being adjusted: the tax preparation, the investment management, which we just talked about, uh, miscellaneous deductions. We used to have a column for miscellaneous deductions where you could put a lot of stuff in the, in the good old days three years ago, right? Um, now it's subject to a maximum of 2% of your adjusted gross income, the AGI. 
And then moving expenses, which used to be able to be deducted, is another thing that went by the wayside. And like I say, when you take everything in its totality, most of the time people are going to find that if they take the standard deduction, it's going to be better off. Now, I'm, I'm one who used to itemize a lot. And one of the reasons was that uh, my wife and I give very liberally to charities, a uh, pretty good percentage. And I thought, well, you know, with that amount, it'll always be worth doing it. Nope, not anymore. Um, even though we are pretty uh, generous with uh, charitable deductions, uh, our kids have all moved out of the house. <laughs> house is paid for, right? So uh, there's a lot of things that uh, just it isn't worth it anymore. We just go with the standard deduction. All right, so let's get into some specifics that will help you in preparing for the end of the year. Let's go ahead and hit the next one, please. All right, some tax strategies that will help you out. One that applies directly to you folks. Go ahead and hit the next button again. And that is the 20% uh, pass-through deduction. So if you're not aware of this, this is something to be aware of. Um, and you can look up uh, some information on it. It's a smart thing to be uh, a bit knowledgeable about this for sure. And that is the 20% pass-through deduction is available to small business owners. There are some qualifications. I mean, you have to qualify for it. But the this is came from the something called the TCJA. It was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, right? It was the, that's the big one that was done in 2018. So if you didn't know the acronym, it's the TCJA. Nobody ever says that, but it was the big 2018 tax adjustment. But one of the things they had. If you have, um, let's say, $100,000 in pass-through income, and most small businesses are pass-throughs, okay? That's what they are. Uh, if you've got an S corporation, if you've got a partnership, you've got an LLC or an LLP, those are pass-through entities, okay? So if you've got $100,000 of pass-through income, you could qualify to deduct $20,000, reducing your income taxes by a whopping $4,400, okay? So you've got a pass-through deduction that you can take on a partnership, an S Corp, an LLC, or an LLP, and $100,000 would translate into a $20,000 deduction, which would reduce your taxes by about $4,400. So that's a pretty cool thing if you're in the 22% income bracket, which that's, you know, you'd be in that range with that income. So that's 4,400 bucks. Guys, that'll, uh, you know, buy you cruise tickets and, uh, and a, a decent little vacation um, right there. And they say ignorance is bliss, but boy, it can be expensive. You know what I mean? So this is one to make sure that you read up on or make sure that uh, you don't forget because it is available to you as a small business person. Okay. All right. A couple more tax strategies. Next one, a couple more tax strategies to take a look at this time of year, you should look at maximizing your contributions um, to your 401ks or other tax deferred uh, vehicles that you may have available to you. Um, there, there's a bit of, I, I, I would say wisdom, but there's a bit of a counsel that I always give to folks that are close to retirement, and that is to make sure that you are at least making contributions big enough to max out the um, employer matching funds. So if you're the matching fund, if you're the employer, um, then it's to the advantage of your employee, or if you're the one who's in the position to take advantage of it, um, if you're doing, your, doing it for yourself and you've got a policy with your business that you have matching, you should at least deduct or uh, contribute enough to get all of the matching dollars. Why? Because it's OPM, it's other people's money. But in general, it's a good idea, especially if you're getting close to retirement, you're trying to pack away as much as you can for those 25, 30 years without a paycheck. Uh, you should be putting as much as you can into those accounts uh, within reason, but at least enough to get all of the OPM, all of the other people's money, all the matching funds. Contributing to HSAs. Guys, I think in our current tax, struct tax structure, my favorite vehicle uh, is the HSA. Uh, this is an amazing tool because it has tax advantages as well as being uh, deferred. You've got some tax-free capabilities of it, or, and um, it's just, it's a powerful tool. You should look at maximizing or opting to maximize your HSA uh, opportunities. 
Next one would be tax bracket management. Um, one of the things that is very, very powerful when you go for 25, 30 years without a paycheck is having money that you can draw on to spend, to live off of that you don't have to pay taxes on. The example of that, one of the example would be the Roth. Now, Roth is an example of something that has the tax trifecta. Okay, it grows tax-free, one. You can pull it out and spend the money tax-free, two. And you can pass it on to your beneficiaries, your heirs, tax-free, three. So it's, it's a very powerful tool. Well, how do you get Roth? Well, you have a limit of contributions of 6,500 or 7,000 a year in your Roth account. Okay, so you, you're limited on how much you can contribute to it. Guys, you are not limited at all on what you can convert. Why? Because the government is finally getting the taxes that they've been waiting for, and they're fine with you converting as much as you want. But if you convert too much, you could cause yourself to bump into the next tax, tax bracket. And so efficient planning for Roth conversions would include looking at the implication of your taxes by the number of dollars you want to do for Roth conversions. It's something that I often will counsel folks to spread out. So we'll take a look at the strategy. You know, how much do you want to convert? Well, maybe it makes sense to do 20,000 this year and do 20,000 next year and 20,000 the third year and you'll get the 60,000 that you were looking for. If you did the 60,000 all at once, it would bump you into a higher tax bracket and less money would be moved into the Roth. So that's one consideration. Another consideration is this, and, and folks, you should be thinking about this. This is very, very important if you do not I don't know how you can not be aware of this because as business owners, this is a big deal to you. We are at historic low tax rates. Current legislation, uh, the last few years has made it probably one of the most friendly business environments tax wise that uh, we've ever seen, at least in your lifetime. And so when taxes are at historically low rates and they are, all right, nobody can argue that. You pull up a chart and you'll see we're at historically low tax rates. The benefit of a Roth versus having money that continues to grow tax-free, or ta not tax-free, but tax-deferred, so your IRA accounts, your IRA accounts are going to grow tax-free. If you pull it out and convert it to Roth, you'll pay the taxes on it. Well, in 10 years, if nothing changes, if the tax rate stayed the same, guys, math is math. And when you do algebra, A times B times C is the same as B times C times A or A times C times B. Okay, it's their equivalents. And if you grow the money for 10 years and then tax it, or you tax it now and grow it at the same rate, you're going to have the same dollars. And don't let anybody confuse you with fancy math that somehow a Roth grows faster than anything else because you pay ta taxes now and you can never catch a Roth baloney. It's math. It's going to be the same number. But if there is a change in interest rates, and interest rates are higher in 5, 10, 15 years than they are now, then the Roth will have huge benefits just on a dollar amount. It will also have the tax, other additional tax benefits of pulling out and spending it tax-free, passing it on tax-free. Okay, but just in a horse race, in a dead horse race, if all you're looking at dollars is dollars, then an IRA and a Roth are going to come out the same unless you change the tax rates. So I circle back to my starting point. Why is it a good idea to do Roth conversions now? It's because if rates are higher, which I believe they're going to be, in that context, it's smart to convert now and let it grow tax-free, and you will be ahead of somebody who just keeps it in their IRA. All right? So those are at least two reasons, and there's more to consider Roth. But do it smart, which means you do it inside of the tax existing bracket and don't bump yourself into a next bracket for no reason. All right? Again, if you have any questions, holler out, but I'll just keep going, assuming that you are all enthralled and, and, uh, and following this and you don't have any questions. All right. Number three, dumping or lo dumping, losing stocks. This is called tax loss harvesting. Um, you, if you have a capital gain loss or a capital loss, rather, um, those can be carried forward. And you can use that, you can use about $3,000 a year, direct uh, reduction on your taxes, and you can carry those losses forward. So tax loss harvesting is at the end of the year, if you've got some stuff that's underwater and it isn't terribly nostalgic to you and you can let go of it, uh, sometimes if it doesn't look like it's coming back anytime soon, declare it a loss, okay? Sell it, declare the loss, capture that loss, and then you can use that to defray uh, taxes in the future. Okay. And the last one is sell gainers if the 12% uh, 
if you're in the 12% tax bracket, uh, you have 12, you have zero capital gains. Well, how could somebody be in the 12% tax bracket? That's not a lot of money. That means their taxable income, their AGI is less than $40,000. Um, yeah, so um, how's that good? Well, you know, sometimes people are retired and they're living off of money that is um, uh, already been taxed. And so their actual taxable income is not that much. Okay, it's not difficult to do that. And with a married couple, um, you've got, you know, up to 12%, that first bracket, you have zero capital gains. So if you're doing some uh, income management to where you are living off of income that is not taxed or very little of it is taxed and you can take advantage of that, you can sell gains and be able to capture that position of being in a low to no tax uh, position to take those, uh, to close those out and take those gains. Okay, click on the next one. So let's talk about Medicare costs. Oh, what, what are the other things? Now, nah, let's, let's keep on going. I just looked at the clock. I can get sidetracked on stuff because I like talking about things I'm interested in. Uh, but I think we'll, we will defer to stay on track here. Uh, Medicare. Now, guys, Medicare costs come into play when you are older, and sometimes as business owners, business owners, uh, you get older, right? You hang on there for a little while, and eventually you start looking, ah, maybe we're going to get out of this business. I'm getting close enough to where I think retirement might be in my future. And uh, then you come talk to somebody uh, like me, somebody that focuses on that. And by the way, um, if you need help from an oncologist, you don't go to your general practitioner or your uh, optometrist. There is specialization, and when you look at, when you're looking for advice or guidance, you want to be specializing in an area of, of the expertise of the person you're talking about. And in the financial world, there's a lot of different specialties, if you will. So when we're talking about Medicare, make sure you're getting advice from somebody who specializes in Medicare. Now, anybody who has gotten anywhere close to the year of 64 and a half, or 64 to 64 and a half. Your mailbox gets inundated every day by 12, 13 pieces of mail that somebody's trying to sell you Medicare-related coverage. Um, it's a big industry, and it's kind of like the, the fishing season up in Alaska. It only lasts a few months, the open enrollment period, where they do pr pretty much all their work. And so you get inundated by all this information. Just be careful. Uh, there's a lot of sales that, that involved in it. Uh, you want to make sure you're getting good, solid advice. So let's talk about just some of the basics. Go ahead and hit the next slide. Some of the basics would be this. When you're looking at Medicare costs, you need to recognize that, yeah, it's a fact, and everybody is required at 65, plus or minus three months, to register for, register for Medicare. Now, there's some confusion here because, yes, you are required to, to register. Yeah, but I'm still working. I don't need to take Medicare. It doesn't matter. You still have to... Uh, sign up. Guys, I run into several people, usually two or three a month, where they say, oh, no, I didn't sign up for that stuff because I, I don't need it. <laughs> That's nothing to do with you need it. You turn 65 and you're required. Really? <laughs> and there's this kind of like, really? Am I in trouble? Yeah, you kind of are. <laughs> okay. They give you three months either side of your 65th birthday to register. Now, there's two parts to Medicare in the basic original recipe. There's part A and part B. Part A, everybody has to register for. And Part B as well, except that there's some exceptions and there's some, uh, you know, some ways to avoid that for a while. Not forever, but for a while. And so everybody has to sign up for Part A. Don't worry, it doesn't cost anything. And it really doesn't do you much good. Part A is the hospitalization part of the, of the process and it's just, it's kind of a joke almost. But everybody has to sign up for it. It doesn't cost you anything. And it is tied with a, a law that everybody has to do it. Now, Part B, where you get the uh, medical coverage, is also required if you are retired or you're not working where you are covered under an, a plan that would be approved and it would allow you to opt out. So, for example, if you get 65 years old and you are working in an environment where you are covered by a plan that is qualified, it is approved. And generally that means there's going to be 25 people or more. If you've got a plan that's got 25 people or more, 
in general, you are exempted from Medicare Part B. Okay, as long as you're covered by something else that is an approved alternative. If you're not, then you also have to pick up Part B and you can see there on that first line that if you make $85,000, uh, that's for a single, married it's 170. If you make 85,000 or less, or as a joint couple, 170,000 or less, you have to sign up for Part B and it will cost you $135.50, okay? And again, the, the exemptions are on that is when you're with something that is an approved alternative to that. And generally that's you're working, you're still working, you're covered by a medical plan. And then you can see the different uh, brackets for income for single and married jointly to find out what your charges are. So you gotta be making a lot of money, $750,000 or more to get up over 460 or to get to $460. Um, you could be making up to $750,000 after 65 of taxable income and your Medicare Part B coverage is going to be $433.40. Okay. So there's kind of your ranges of the costs associated with it. But the important thing is don't be caught in that, well, I, I don't need it or I'm still working. No, you still have to register. <laughs> okay. Please make sure you do. All right, next one. Let's talk about RMDs because as we get to uh, this end, we're kind of talking about this spectrum, this end of your, uh, this end of the spectrum where you're getting maybe towards retirement age. Please don't forget also, especially this time of year, if you are old enough to be impacted by required minimum distributions, that means you turn 70 and a half this year. If you turn 70 and a half this year, you are going to be impacted by required minimum distributions. That means that how, however long you have been contributing to your IRA, to your 401ks, your deferred income, where you have not, or deferred taxes, you have not been paying taxes on certain uh, income classes. Well, when you get to 70 and a half, the government's going, okay, that's it. We've waited long enough. Now you need to start paying taxes on that money. All of it? No, no. They have a formula, and by the way, in true true form <laughs> to some uh, criticisms of government, that, that formula changes every year. So it's not like you can just get a number and say, well, this is my, R my RMD, my required minimum distribution. No, you gotta check the chart every year because the formula changes. I'll give you a, a hint. Your first year, when you the year you turn 70 and a half, you should count on about 4%. It usually works out to be just under 3.87 about, but if you if you allow for four percent of your income that has not been taxed yet your it's called qualified income then you'll be about right on you got to be careful you got to be careful hit the next slide please if you miss it even by a little bit you're going to get nailed with a 50 percent penalty so don't do that all right overestimate over uh, contribute or take out a little bit more than, than what it says you need to, just to be sure, because that penalty is a nasty one. Okay. So required minimum distributions kick in when you're 70 and a half, by the way, just so you know, you're allowed to wait. You're allowed to wait up till April the first time to pay it. Well, that may or may not be a good idea because if you pay it in like right now in December, of the, if you turn 70 and a half this year, you could do that. Or you could wait until April and pay it. You go, well, I'm gonna do that. I'll, I'll wait as long as I can. Okay, fine. So you pay your first year in April, the following December 31st, the second one will be due and you'll be two, doing two of them in the same year. So just be careful about that. They give some leeway on the very first year that you do it. And that's just, I think, for people that forget. Um, but it's a good idea if you do this uh, because from there on out, you're going to be needing to take out your RMDs by December 31st. You don't get till April. You only get that mulligan, if you will. That's a golf term uh, the first time you do it. Go to the next one. Let's talk about qualified charitable deductions. These are called QCDs for short. And a QCD, um, if you're over 70 and a half, so again, we're talking about this age group now, you're, you're taking RMDs, but you also might consider something that's called a qualified charitable deduction or a QCD. 
because this is something you can integrate with your RMDs because you can take a qualified charitable deduction and it can double up or satisfy, if you will, all or part of your RMD. So this is a way that you could take your RMD and have it be a charitable deduction. Now that's a kind of a cool thing when you think about it because you're taking the RMD out to pay the taxes on it, okay? So the government wants their money. They want you to pull out and take it out. But if you take out that RMD and donate it to a qualified charitable di distribution or in a qualified charitable distribution, then you turn around and get it tax deferred or not tax deferred, but you, it, it becomes a tax deduction. <laughs> so it's a good thing. Check it out with your accountant. Uh, see if that's something, if you're at the right age, if you qualify for a QCD, at least just don't, don't leave it on the table. All right. That's something that you totally forget or you didn't know about. Don't let ignorance cost you on this one. All right, we just got a couple more things. We're spot on our time, by the way. Uh, go to the next one, please. Let's talk about reviewing beneficiaries. And this is just housekeeping. At the end of the year, a couple things to think about. Guys, things change in terms of beneficiaries. Beneficiaries are the people that are listed to inherit certain types of assets that you own. And by the way, if you want to do a favor to your whoever it is that's going to wind up being the executor for your will and or the people that are the beneficiaries of your assets, try to keep it out of probate. Probate is kind of long, kind of expensive, uh, kind of messy sometimes. Although I tell you, in the state of Washington, probate actually is in one of the five easiest of all the 50 states. It still takes about a year and things are tied up. And so if you have accounts that have got money in it, you can have designated beneficiaries to those accounts. And with that, all somebody has to do, it's called the TOD, a transfer on death. All somebody has got to do is show up with a driver's license to prove who they are and, um, and a copy of death certificate. And if you're listed as the beneficiary, boom, you don't have to go through probate. It transfers to you immediately. TOD, transfer on death. Okay, click on the uh, click on the screen. I'm talking about the next one, and it didn't. I just realized it didn't show. One more time. Actually, that's it. Hold, hold, hold. Uh, that's okay. We'll just transition into that. So beneficiaries, check them. Okay, see if you have beneficiaries designated. You should have primary and contingency. A primary. And then a contingency, if something happens to that person, there's somebody that you would want the assets to go to if something happened to the first one and, and they didn't, they weren't there. The other thing is you can change them. You can change beneficiaries anytime you want. Um, and people do. <laughs> and I've seen some interesting situations where someone will uh, think they're a beneficiary and they go there and they find out that, no, you're not. They actually, that person changed it uh, two weeks before they died and they're giving that money to somebody else. And you're going, whoa, wait a minute. But, but they told me, well, I'm sorry, it says right here that it belongs to so-and-so. Do you know them? Yeah, that's my brother. <laughs> anyway, bottom line is uh, you can change beneficiaries, and you should probably put that on a checklist. Most of these things, it would be smart to put it on a checklist as a yearly. It comes up maybe in the 1st of December. It says, here's the things you ought to be thinking about over the next month to make sure they get done. Everybody ought to have a list like that. And checking your beneficiaries, uh, just seeing if you want to... Um, uh, keep them. <laughs> maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, something to think about. Next thing, talk to your family about finances. This one is very interesting, especially this time of year where a lot of families get together. Uh, it's a good idea if you've got people that are going to wind up being the beneficiaries of your assets to talk with them. And uh, if you've got somebody that's going to be your, uh, you know, it's going to be the executor of your estate, um, you know, make sure they understand where things are. Uh, do them a favor, you know, give them a clue as to what they could do to make it easier on that person. Guys, it's, it's traumatic to a, for, to a family to lose a loved one, but it's also traumatic to somebody who has never been a, a, a trustee or an executor to find out, oh my gosh, now what do I do? And they don't have a clue and your stuff is all over everywhere and they've got to spend hours and days and a lot of money chasing around, taking, cleaning up on aisle four, the mess that you could have easily handled if you would have made a list of stuff and let them know what's where things are. So just something to think about. The last thing I'll mention is this, and it's prioritizing planning. Hit the last slide, please, the next to the last. And that is just think about um, the fact that 
this is a good time of year. Put it on the calendar so that you can do some financial proper planning before, like, you know, at the beginning of December, before things get nutty and crazy, get a punch list of things that have to be done before the end of the year. The other thing is to, when you're doing that, just put on your checklist. You're going to write this down. Uh, look out two to three years. So not just what I got to get done by the end of this year. Is there anything that should be done that it has a longer time frame on it? It's just a good punch list item. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a measure of, of successful people, the ones who look ahead, business owners. Uh, you have to look ahead. You have to budget. You have to think where people are going to shift in their uh, preferences. If you've got a product, um, is there a changing demographic that you've got to think about that's going to be different two years from now just because it worked this year? Is it going to work next year? Uh, that, that kind of forward thinking. It's a good time to put that on the calendar and say, you know, let, let's talk about this stuff. Okay. Hit the last one, please. And folks, this would be your time. We've got about three minutes left here to any questions. This is open forum, but uh, there is an opportunity for you if you have additional questions. Sometimes, especially when you can't see who's in the room, it's very common for people to have questions but not feel comfortable asking the questions. So part of what SOFA requires us to provide, and we do it happily, is the opportunity for you to have more of a personalized strategy uh, session, if you will, for half hour, 45 minutes, even up to up to an hour, let's say, uh, if you want to um, talk with additional questions, you can do it in a more private setting. Okay. So, any questions? Last couple of minutes. Any questions? Yeah, and everyone is unmuted right now. So, if you do, you do have a question, just go ahead and speak up. Thanks, did you get anything out of this? Did you, did you get some value? I mean, I'm a big boy. I can take it, but uh, hopefully you got some, there was some things in here that uh, would be helpful. Yes, Ryan. I well, sure I, did. I, My I, name is Sherry and I appreciate all your knowledge. Thank you. I actually had a question for you. <laughs> um, Go for it. When you said that no longer, um, we can no longer deduct moving expenses. Does that also apply if you specifically moved for a job? Um, yeah, the, my understanding is that's the case. Uh, the only exception that I would know to that would be uh, business. It, it, a business, ex, business expenses for relocating uh, is, is treated a little bit different, but there used to be just a blanket exemption for, for moving in general. It was just kind of a, a bonus that was in there, and they, they tossed that one out when they went to the uh, broader deduction. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay. Well, we just want to thank you, Ryan, really you bet. much for your time here. Um, we are going to be sending out a survey to, a survey to all the attendees. Um, please fill that out. We're going to be getting that to Ryan, and that's going to help him um, with his business and just his presentations. Um, so we appreciate if you do fill out that survey. Um, we'll be email, emailing that survey to you. Um, that is it for this uh, uh, session. Um, I guess one, one thing I would add on that, I, I would just add this real quick, and that is that that one on one session could be done online just like this. I mean, it doesn't have to be in person. Uh, if somebody's thinking that the travel would be an issue, uh, you know, that's why we use this technology today. We'd certainly use it uh, in the future for that as well. Excellent. And where are you located, Ryan? Um, actually, physically located in Redmond, Washington. Redmond. Oh, okay. Excellent. Okay, that's not too far. I, oh, will we get a copy of these slides by any chance emailed to us? I don't think um, that's we can do that. Email. But at, at least we don't. But if uh, Sean and Ryan want to, they could do that. Okay. Very good. Okay. And yeah, we, we you can reach out to us and we can get you a copy if that's okay with you, Ryan, because they are your slides. Understand. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that's it for this webinar, and uh, we really appreciate everyone attending. Again, we will be sending out that survey. Please fill that out. Um, and contact uh, myself or Ryan here at the Washington Center for Women in Business with any questions you have. Um, and thank you, thank you everyone for attending. We appreciate it. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas to you all too. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye.